Believe it or not, Star Trek sci-fi escapades have often been based on actual events that happened here on Earth. Let's boldly go where no fan has gone before and look at some of the true stories that inspired Star Trek. Star Trek loves to talk about politics and social justice, but at the same time, the original series seemed to contradict the message. What with its long track record of ditzy women in impossibly short skirts who lack any sort of self-reliance or tenacity. If you've ever found that annoying, it might comfort you to know that Star Trek writers Herb Solo and Robert Justman often used racy content to distract TV censors of the time from the show's otherwise political content. In the second season episode, A Private Little War, Kirk contemplates the ethics of intervening in someone else's war, a fairly controversial subject for the time. We are wise enough to know that we are wise enough not to interfere in the way of a man or another world. During the episode, he kisses a partially dressed woman with an open mouth, no less. That particular scene was actually written for the purpose of drawing attention away from the episode's storyline, which was a thinly veiled commentary on whether or not the United States should get involved in Vietnam. It was a pretty genius move, and it worked. The episode aired in February 1968, just after the launch of the Tet Offensive. Over a century after Jack the Ripper stopped terrorizing the Whitechapel District of London, we still can't stop talking about him. He's been featured in films, television shows, comic books, video games, and pretty much every other type of media you can think of. And for some reason, Star Trek used Jack the Ripper as inspiration for the 1967 episode Wolf in the Fold. A woman causes an accident that gives Scotty a concussion, so Kirk and McCoy take him to a pleasure planet that winds up looking rather suspiciously like the Whitechapel District of London circa 1888. While they're down there, women keep getting killed, and Scotty keeps getting found holding a bloody knife, so things are not looking good for everybody's favorite engineer. This happened under Argelian jurisdiction. If they want to arrest him, try him, even convict him, I have to go along with it. But he's suffering from a severe concussion. In case you're worried, Scotty isn't the killer. If he were, we would have missed out on decades of his charming Scottish brogue. What are you standing around for? Do you not know a jailbreak when you see one? No, the real killer is the actual Jack the Ripper, who, as it turns out, is a formless entity that needs fear and also foggy streets to survive. What a relief. Not every based-on-a-true-story Star Trek episode is meant to be a complex political allegory on truth and justice. Some are written simply for the purpose of being silly and entertaining. Some aren't even based on true stories. Instead, they're inspired by conspiracy theories that are probably just nonsense. Season 4 of Deep Space Nine tackles the complex social problem of people who actually think the government might be hiding aliens at Area 51. In Little Green Men, Quark, Rom, Odo, and Nog are accidentally sent back in time to Area 51. The 20th century? You mean we traveled back through time? More than 400 years! The episode handily explains the 1947 crash of the high-altitude balloon that spawned decades of conspiracy theories and culminated in the 2019 storming of Area 51 for what it really was. The crash of a Ferengi shuttle piloted by a race of supercapitalist humanoid aliens with very large ears. Sometimes it takes a big thing to shine a light on important social problems. Before the riot at Attica Prison in 1971, many American inmates were kept in deplorable conditions. At Attica, prisoners were allotted one shower a week and one roll of toilet paper a month. Things came to a head when the prisoners rebelled, taking hostages and releasing a list of demands. Notably, the prisoners' list of demands didn't include let us out of prison. It was mostly just a plea for humane conditions, including religious freedom, an end to censorship of their personal correspondence, and better living conditions. They've forgotten about us. So what do we do? We make them remember. The Attica riot changed prisoner treatment in America and was the inspiration for a key incident in Deep Space Nine's two-part episode, Past Tense. In this time-traveling episode, writer Ira Bear drew from the Attica prison riot when constructing the 2024 Bell Riots, an incident in which the occupants of a repressive sanctuary district for homeless and unemployed people rebel. As far as Star Trek's Earth is concerned, the event helped usher humans toward the peaceful, post-scarcity society enjoyed by Kirk and friends. The Troubles is a phrase used to describe the conflict in Northern Ireland between 1968 and 1998. While the mostly Protestant Unionists wanted Northern Ireland to remain part of the United Kingdom, the mostly Catholic Nationalists, led by the Irish Republican Army, or IRA, wanted to join the Republic of Ireland. The confrontation resulted in the deaths of around 3,600 people. Star Trek The Next Generation Season 3 episode The High Ground is about a violent conflict between the people of the planet of Rutia 4 and a bomb-planting group of rebel separatists called 
and SATA. The parallels between Ansada and the IRA are so thinly veiled that Data and Picard actually have an on-screen conversation about the parallels between Ansada and the IRA. Data even says the conflict in Northern Ireland is an example of successful terrorism. I've been reviewing the history of armed rebellion, and it appears that terrorism is an effective way to promote political change. The episode aired in 1990 when the real conflict was still very much a thing, and the content was alarming enough to the British powers of TV that it was heavily edited in the United Kingdom and Ireland, which included the removal of the Data Picard conversation. As of 2019, it has still never been shown in its entirety on the Emerald Isle. Star Trek's habit of drawing on real life sometimes even dips into medical mysteries of the past in order to flesh out a character or just add some depth to a storyline. One such example is the similarity between the memory condition suffered by Captain Archer in the Enterprise episode Twilight and the story of a real-life medical case from 1953. In the show, Archer suffers from a disorder caused by parasites that live in non-linear time, which causes all new memories to fade within hours. They haven't caused any tissue damage, but they're impairing certain synaptic functions. They're preventing you from forming new, long-term memories. The storyline seems to be based on the case of Henry Malayasin, a 27-year-old assembly worker who suffered from severe epilepsy. Malayasin underwent brain surgery to remove his hippocampus, and his seizures stopped, but he also lost the ability to form new memories. Malayasin could remember some things from the past, but nothing from the moment he emerged from the surgery. In the Deep Space Nine episode Far Beyond the Stars, Sisko is given a vision by a bunch of mysterious wormhole aliens. In the vision, he's living in 1950s Harlem, working as a sci-fi writer. During his time in his dream, he deals with racist publishers who refuse to publish his story on the grounds that it has a black protagonist, and he encounters various characters who look an awful lot like his crewmates back home. Fortunately, the episode is blissfully free from ruby slippers and talking scarecrows. But it wasn't a dream. It seems likely that the episode was inspired by the comics code Authority's 1956 decision to disallow the publication of an entertaining comic story titled Judgment Day, which featured a black protagonist. Judge Charles Murphy said outright that he wouldn't even approve the story if it had a black protagonist. Entertaining comics published it anyway, even though its lack of official approval meant that it wouldn't get wide distribution. Oh, I like it all right. It's good. It's very good. But you know I can't print it. Why not? Oh, come on, Benny. After that, Murphy embarked on a personal vendetta against the publisher, personally reviewing everything they submitted for approval. The company went out of business a few years later. In 1988, the USS Vincennes shot down Iran Air Flight 655. The incident happened toward the end of the Iran-Iraq War while the Vincennes was exchanging fire with Iranian ships in the Persian Gulf. The official U.S. Navy account of the incident said the passenger plane was mistaken for an enemy jet. Still, 279 civilian passengers and crew members died when the Vincennes shot two surface-to-air missiles at the plane. In the Deep Space Nine episode Rules of Engagement, Worf has been accused of a similar crime, destroying a civilian ship carrying 441 people. Much of the episode is a courtroom drama in which the Klingon Empire is trying to get Worf extradited for war crimes, and Sisko is trying to stop that from happening. The story ends predictably. As it turns out, the whole thing was just a setup, and Worf actually fired on a ship full of dead bodies. Isn't it possible that the ship he saw was sending out false sensor images, and that this whole affair was staged? As for the real-life incident, well, it's unfortunately not that black and white. Real people died on Air Flight 655, and we probably won't ever know exactly what happened. Star Trek often has the uncanny ability to address problems that we're still discussing decades later. In the original series episode, The Ultimate Computer, the Enterprise becomes the proud owner of a new computer called the M5, which is capable of running all the ship's systems with minimal human intervention. This is immediately not cool as far as Kirk and McCoy are concerned, though Spock is predictably fascinated by the idea. I don't like it, Jim. A vessel this size cannot be run by one computer. We are attempting to prove that it can run this ship more efficiently than man. You can probably see the ending coming from several million light years away. M5 isn't really the ultimate computer, it's the ultimate killing machine. In a mock battle meant to demonstrate its abilities, M5 takes down another starship with lethal force. When Kirk convinces it that it's a killer, it shuts itself down, thus preventing a Skynet-style takeover of the Federation. The episode was a reaction to the rise of the computer, and genuine concern about what would happen if we gave machines too much power and control. It deals with questions we still ask ourselves today, like what happens when human beings automate everything, and then everyone is left without a job and a purpose. Twenty? I can't run a starship with twenty crew. The M5 can. And what am I supposed to do? 
Over the years, Star Trek has asked plenty of questions about war, territory, and unprovoked attacks. The Enterprise Incident, a third season episode of the original series, was based on the Pueblo Incident of 1968, which involved an American communications monitoring ship and some North Korean naval vessels. The Koreans claimed the USS Pueblo was in Korean waters, while the US claimed it was in international waters. After the Koreans opened fire and then boarded the ship, they caught the captain destroying electronics and documents. The crew was brought back to North Korea, where they endured 11 months of interrogation and torture. The Star Trek version of this story is almost exactly the same. The Enterprise is just outside of the Romulan neutral zone on an observation mission when a bunch of Romulan ships show up and open fire, forcing Kirk to surrender. Before the crew is taken prisoner, Kirk orders the destruction of top-secret equipment. Then he and Spock are taken to a Romulan outpost where they're threatened with interrogation and torture. But there are Romulan methods completely effective against humans and human weaknesses. After that, the two plot lines diverge somewhat. Spock and Kirk fake their deaths, and then Kirk and McCoy put on pointy ear disguises, which is evidently enough to make the Romulans not recognize them, so they can infiltrate the Romulan outpost. But we're gonna guess that none of those last bits happened during the real incident. Star Trek couldn't pass up an opportunity to comment on the Cold War in general and Chernobyl in particular. So, nearly three decades before HBO's Chernobyl miniseries became a gleam in the eye of some cable TV executive, Star Trek was busy creating an allegory on the incident with Star Trek VI The Undiscovered Country. In the film, there's a major explosion at an energy facility on Praxis, the Klingon moon. Like the Russians, the Klingons pretend the accident is no big deal, because if they admit otherwise, they admit weakness, and not being weak is like the Klingons' whole deal. In the undiscovered country, the Klingon Chancellor even has a familiar name, Garkon. In case you need a nudge, that kinda sounds like Garbachev. Garkon decides to open peace talks with the Federation, and there's even talk of dismantling the star bases and other military structures around the neutral zone. The real storyline and the fake one start to diverge at this point, because no one would like the movie if the star bases came down and if everyone had a party. Or would they? Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more grunge videos about your favorite TV shows are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.